Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle, and this is Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. I'm Wayne Tuttle. I'll be the host today all by myself. What was that I heard? Can you ask somebody to mute it? <laughs> People screaming in the background. Welcome back. I'm Wayne Tuttle. I'll be your host today all by myself for the first time in a while. So uh, we want to mention right off the bat, hit the notifications bell. Leave a comment if you want to leave a comment. Please subscribe to our channel, watch our videos. We appreciate it. Now, for quite a while we've been kind of pushing and beating on the Lust for Gold thing. And the film actually got carried over an extra week at Harkins. So we thank Harkins and thank everybody for all their support and coming out to see the film. We'll see and kind of let you know what's going on with that and then any other further projects coming here in the future. But this week we get back to the normal routine of chasing legends. So we're going to take back and go back in the Wayback Machine and start kind of turning it back. About 1990, and I couldn't tell you the actual year. I know it was around 1990. I'm about I was 25, 26. And we had heard a story about um, an Arastra back in the mountains. Now, years later, I noticed Thomas Glover had it in his um, the Holmes manuscript and mentioned one that Brownie Holmes had found in the junction of East and West Boulder Canyon. And I think this is kind of the one we'd heard about. And it was supposed to be somewhere in Brush Corral Basin, kind of towards the North End or something somewhere. And a couple people had kind of talked about it and it had been lost. It would get cleared out and people would rediscover it. But then another storm would come through and everybody lost it. So we thought, being in our mid-twenties and thinking we're pretty bright, we figured we could find it. So we got together top and we thought we'll make a few trips in and we'll grid out and we'll check an area. Now, we're 25, 26, 27 years old. We don't know a lot about Arastros. We hadn't found any Mexican old Arastros. We'd seen a few. I'm far more familiar with the subject matter now. But we thought, with our limited experience and knowledge, we could just go out and find this thing. It wouldn't be that difficult. So we gridded out an area, a rectangular area. I figured, I think there was three of us, but I keep thinking there might have been four. So it might have been someone came along during one of the trips. But it was myself, Steve, and Mark. And again, I'll use people's last names. If I've talked to them recently or made some sort of connection and they're kind of like, cool, you're telling us this old stories. And then I can add the names. Until that point, I really don't like to give the last names of some of these guys who knows where they're at, what they've been. Though this story is pretty, pretty, pretty mellow. So we went in first trip. One of the things we did, as I'm sure everybody knows, is uh, members those weed things and they're like a big stick and they got that fork on the end for like popping weeds, you know, in the yard. Everybody have that implement, you'd pop the weed, and then you'd have to bend over still and pick it up. But everybody had one of those around the house, and we all had them around the house. And what we did was take that metal piece at the end, kind of pulled it out further. And we figured as we walked, we would look for areas where anything that had deeper roots, well, the raster wouldn't be there. And anything, any place we saw something of a clear area where there was no roots, we would have these, and we would just use them like hiking sticks but be able to pop them into the ground. And it should be within three or four inches, we would figure, so we should be able to hit something. And if we kept hitting rock, we found the Arastra. So it's a pretty good, pretty good theory. So we went out the first time, spent about seven, eight hours, walked ourselves out. We didn't see any reason to stay back in the mountains or camp in that area to do it over days. So I thought, okay, heavy rain had come through. We went out, did this, marked it off. Any area we thought, looked possible we would kind of mark um, and there was a number of areas but we never found anything hitting something like a bedrock or stones or something significantly through there 
So we, we waited till the next storm washed through. And this is January, February, you know. And back then, storms would come through, and a big storm came through, and we came back out again because that's what we're hoping for is it to wash out. And we went out, and the next time, instead of we did the rectangle like this, the next trip we did like a long rectangle. Um, again, we were in our mid-20s. We thought we knew what we were doing. I couldn't tell you what we were doing. Um, I can't tell you the reason I do things now sometimes. So definitely back then, I have no clue why we decided to change that. And there, the map I have, I have the map somewhere of when we did this and we're drawing in pencil and, you know, nothing significant though, this trip. And so it was the third trip we went in. And I know there was only three of us on that trip. And Mark yells out, you know, guys, there's something here, but it doesn't seem big enough. And when he found, he started pushing away the dirt, and after an inch or so of dirt, as he started kicking at it and pushing it back, there were these rocks, and they were kind of flat-faced, and they looked like they'd been grouted somehow. And it was about this wide, about a foot and a half wide. So we looked at it, and we started kind of trying to clean it out and figure out what it was, because we realized very quickly it's about a foot and a half across and it keeps extending, but it can't be an arastra. So we kept going down, going down, going down, and after about three and a half feet, four feet, it just ends and it's kind of squared off. And we thought, and, and we still didn't understand what it was, and we're clearing the dirt around and brushing it off and looking at it, and we were like, I don't, I don't, I don't quite get it. So we started working our way the other direction. And it was getting late in the day, and we finally had found where it kind of detoured and kicked off to the left. And we were just puzzled. So the decision was made, we're not going to stay the night out here. We need to come back. Well, let's just kind of cover some dirt over the area. It's not an area anywhere near a trail or anything where anybody would come by. So if we kick some stuff over it and kind of take some brush and kind of move, remove some of our footprints from there, nobody's going to know we were here. So that was the plan. We left come back and it was um i think we had to wait a little while for a rainstorm but we wanted to wait for another rainfall and we figured the area is probably protected we covered it pretty good and then we went out and we had the topo mat and we went to find it and it's one of those funny things in the mountains and i'm sure a lot of people have had experience in mountains is you'll even pinpoint something and you'll know it's there and you'll look for the landmarks and say it should be right here and then you go there and it's not there it's like 10 feet over and you're just puzzled because you're like, I'm pretty sure it was actually right here. Well, this was one of those things. We were off about 30, 40 feet, but we couldn't figure out at first where it was. And then we found where actually the storms had washed some of the dirt away and it was revealed again. And we were looking at it and going, no, oh, this is it. Looking around and we were thinking, man, that's just kind of weird because it seemed like it was over there. But okay, I guess it's here because I can we can see. And we could see where we had kind of like channeled. Everything was recognizable, even the rock. So we're like, we know have the right one. It's not a different one. So we started working it and we come out and it kind of ends. And I know Steve started working on the other side and then we realized it had this very odd shape to it. And it was about three or four feet, maybe five feet. And it had a cross section. It went across about a foot and a half. And it went about four or five feet. And then it had about three more feet at the top. And it formed the shape of a cross. And we just kind of like, once we realized it and we we're looking at it, it was like, that's kind of particularly odd. We kind of moved around and moved dirt and stuff. And we looked around and we could not find anything else in the area. It was not an arastra, obviously. Someone had taken stones. And I don't know if I'd say the stones were carved because it was kind of rough edge. It wasn't a perfectly straight edge, but it was very close. It had very, been very selective on the rocks. It had all been placed. And it, they'd used something, some type of mortar something, as a grout. And it was very close. There was, it was just very, very, probably a quarter inch or less gaps. And this thing sat there. Now the north end of it was to the north. Well, north end of it is the north. The top of it was to the north, going east and west, and then the bottom was to the south. And we puzzled over it a bit, and then tried to figure out, what do we do about this? You know, it's, we don't know what it is. We don't know how old it is. So we went back into town. We covered it all up, 
made sure we pushed dirt over it everywhere at all because we weren't sure if what we found was significant. We thought we thought about digging it up and kind of starting to pull it apart, see if there was something underneath it. So we decided to get into town and find someone at a community college that was into archaeology or something like that and say, look, we found this weird thing. You want to come back in with us and take a look at it? So we found this guy over at Glendale Community College, got him to go in with us like probably four or five days later. It wasn't that long afterwards. And we went in and kind of uncovered it a bit for him. And he looked at it and he had no clue. He said he couldn't tell. It would be hard to date. You need someone in there. We actually, with him, because we brought a couple of those collapsible shovels that you fold up, we brought one of those and kind of dug around underneath it a little to the edge, but it got real hard packed ground. and So it wasn't like anything was buried there. And um, he made a number of suggestions, but said it could be some sort of archaeological find. He said he wasn't sure. Um, he said it could be something that was only 20, 30, 40 years old. But he said he didn't have enough knowledge base on it to know it could be significantly older. So then it was pack everything up, push all this dirt over it again. And this time we did a little bit more, but we marked everything. And we walked around and we looked at these plants and stuff. And then I think there was even a, um, a, a small Palo Verde or something to the northeast of it. And we did a notch on it to make sure we would always know, okay, there's this notch in this tree. So we did all that and we left. And of course, rain season at that point in time was about done. There was a little bit of rain, I think, probably in April. We, monsoon, summer heat, it was too hot. So we figured we'd go back in the fall. And so we go back in the fall, and that guy brought someone, an instructor, someone far more knowledgeable or something. I have no idea, but it was a guy who was, had a PhD or a bachelor or something. He had a degree in archaeology. And we went back in, and this guy brought a camera and all this stuff, and we were going to document it because he wanted to document it. Um, he was very curious about the descriptions because we had the measurements and descriptions. You have to remember back then, not everybody carried around a camera and the cameras were pretty crappy. There were those little Kodaks and they had a little film most of the time. And we were getting into color, but it was Fuji color, which was really bad color. And nowadays, they all, all the pictures from those eras just faded so badly. So nobody took that many pictures. Um, black and white was probably the best way to go. We had, you know, we figured you draw it and measure it, and that's as good as anything. It was proof. We knew where it was. So we go back out with this guy, and we look, and we look. We found the Palo Verde with the notch, and we went around, and we moved dirt, and we could not find it. Um, whether so it was washed just deeper than wherever we could go, no clue. But we went out, and then about a year or two later with a couple other people, I went back out again and told them the area and what happened. And we went out, and we had um, some rebar, pointed rebar, and we did this, and we poked around looking for it. Knew it had to be within a certain distance of this Palo Verde, and we never came up with anything. So, And there was no sign of it being removed. If someone would have removed it, you would have seen all this dirt had been in and everything. And that was one of the other strange things, because of the rains, it kind of hard-packed the desert back down. But you couldn't see any evidence where we dug each time we went back out. It literally blended back in. We got lucky the one time we were able to uncover it again. Um, to this day, puzzling. I don't know if it was something more modern, recent, of the last 30, 40 years, why someone put it there, its reason or purpose. It was oriented with true north. And it sat there, but it was kind of one of those curious, odd things. And I never, we never did find the Arrestra because we kind of gave up on that. Once we found this, we found the stone cross embedded in Brush Corral Basin. But then it kind of got, for me, definitely kind of lost. And was recently reading the story about Brownie Holmes' Arrestra kind of made it come back to mind. I remember, I remember when we were looking for that Arrestra back there, and we found that stone cross thing. So... Back around 1990, very curious story. I've never heard of anyone finding anything like that. I know there's been some laid out in rocks, but not buried, grouted, and done particularly. I've seen, I know there was one that was done with bricks. This wasn't bricks, this was stone, like um, river stone and stuff, but it was all in definite pieces, very carefully selected pieces. So, um, anyone ever heard that story or anything about that or any story 
relating to that. I don't know. Could have been, who knows out there, some cowboys with a lot of time on their hands. And I would say a lot of time because they had to be very particular how to devise this, but who knows. So there you go. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to story time and kind of tripping back through and reminiscing and going through the past. So like I said, pick up our shirts at represent.com. Long sleeve, short sleeve, gray, black, Legend Superstition Mountains and Dutch Hunter Rendezvous. Please subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bells, leave comments. Until the next time, I'm Wayne Tuttle. You're not. That's Jax. Have a good week and take care.